It's day 25, Lynette, of the lockdown in South Africa. So how would you assess uh, the impact of uh, the measures that have been put in, sp in, put in place by the state and the country's authorities to ensure that the poor and the most vulnerable are protected from the social impact of COVID-19? Um, I'm going to focus on two because there's many, many measures that the state's put in place. First of all, um, the health measures to slow down the coronavirus. Um, is going well, despite the fact that South Africa has a high infection and death rate in Africa. Um, the second thing that I want to focus on is the, the social security protection and safety net. Um, and yeah, there are, there are various challenges. Um, SASA and DSD has prioritized the payment of social grants um, in March 2020 and trying to make that run smooth. Um, and they announced that the elderly and the disabled will be paid first, but SASA released all the grants at the same time, and we saw long queues at payments, payment channels and um, retail stores and ATMs not adhering to social distancing. Um, and there were also no hand sanitations and the other methods for, for curbing the virus. The minister initially announced an 86 million rand available for social relief of distress, and this figure was later adjusted in the president's address to 400 uh, million when he extended the lockdown. And then he also an announced that there will be an unspecified amount available from the Solidarity Fund. Now, ordinarily, social relief of distress is a limited program available to, to those who are waiting for grants, including temporary disability grants. And then there's a, there's a criteria under that broad umbrella that says, um, criteria of undue hardships. Now, we've been struggling to get um, a, a, a definition of that undue hardships. And at one, in one interview, the SASA CEO says it's not for people who are already on grants, but we know that their grant amounts are very small, like the child support grant is uh, for, for 445 rand. Yeah. And we also know that pensions and disability grants are are very little and, and the fact that people now have to cope with, with a lock-in uh, makes the food bill go even higher. Mm -hmm. So the, the Department of Social Development has released some guidelines. They said household that has no sources of income to buy food um, and they were estimating, um, and then there were other criteria, but they were estimating about um, a hundred, um, a million households that require food and they would use various distribution channels and to do so. Now we know that um, there are 18 million people on social grants. Um, those are paid through just about over 11 million bank accounts. But there are other categories of people that have not been catered for in the, the, the social um, development program. And so those are the unemployed. There's an estimated number of people of 5.6 million who have lost their jobs in the formal economy. Some of those will be taken care of in the, in the UIS provisions. But um, in the informal economy, it's estimated that there's 5.5 million people who, who have no form of UIS. And that's uh, in addition, um, people will have to, have to, have to think through that. Um, so, you were talking earlier about food parcels. Yeah. Can I go on? Or, um, yeah, go on, go on. Must I stop for a while? No, no, yeah, go on. Okay. Yeah. So, so there's, there's a need for government to intervene to a, either increase the um, 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 grants, uh, particularly the child support grants. We've put certainly some effort uh, or, or proposals with other NGOs and civil society organizations together. Um, the, the increase of the of the um, the, elders, the old age pension as well as the disability grant, but there's also this big cohort of people who have no form of income, and um, we are asking that government in fact consider the the 18 to 59 without income that those people do get something. We are concerned about the fact that food um, parcels, which is the only device for social relief of the stress that government is using, is inadequate for a number of reasons. The content of the food parcels, the value at the moment, it range between 400 to 1,000. 
is the distribution network um, trustworthy, reliable, and efficient? Does the food reach the, the right target audiences? Um, we have experienced a lack of coordination between the different um, distribution channels, um, that being government, NGOs, and, and businesses. Um, and when people are given food parcels, there are a whole number of things that are not factored into that equation. You need energy sources, electricity, gas, paraffin, and so on, to prepare the food. You need cleaning material to keep the, the, the house environment um, clean. And if you don't have money to buy those, um, you, you, you are in trouble. Now, Lina, so, just, picking up, yeah, just picking up on the issue of the distribution of food parcels, especially mm -hmm. by the politicians, especially those in the lower levels as, uh, you know, the local government councillors. We've seen in the insert earlier that have just played uh, that in the free state, the mayor was accused of posting, uh, you know, a certain, a certain quality of food parcels on social media uh, to be distributed. And when the actual distribution of those food parcels uh, was a far cry from what they've seen on social media. So as a body that advocates for social justice, how do we ensure, I mean, what do you think, uh, what do you think needs to be done to ensure that the food parcels meant for the needy actually reach the needy? Well, I think there's been studies in the world that, that you know, with food parcels, you then have to have a efficient administration. Um, that takes away some of the money from the food. You need to be very targeted and specific about your food parcels. And you need to say, okay, this category of people who have no income um, and who don't have a SASA account and who don't have, we will give these food parcels. But the m remainder of the, of the distribution on humanitarian grounds will happen through the, the bank account that there, there is already. So, for example, um, there's many people on, on, on SASA, um, on the SASA system. Um, one can also begin to look at um, sort of the other systems like the UIF system. Um, government also, local government and provincial government also has systems for distributing. We, we're saying with food parcels you have to be really very targeted and it needs to be small intervention and it needs to be for a limited period of time. Otherwise, you will experience these challenges um, that you have, have cited. And just speaking, um, yeah, and, and just speaking of uh, small interventions we've just mentioned earlier on, you touched on uh, the increase of social grants. I know that you're one of the civic uh, groups or bodies that have uh, lobbied the state or the government to increase social grants by 500 rand for up to six months. Uh, so how, ha have you had a response from the government or the social uh, development department or that uh, department that deals with this? Um, no, we, we haven't had any feedback from government. We're still waiting. I mean, there was going to be a meeting today to discuss the options. Um, we saw in the newsletter that the government has released, or the president has released, that he is aware that the welfare measures um, is inadequate. And we hope that he will address and beef up um, the effort soon. But the, but the government needs to shift from just thinking food parcels to some form of grants, even if it's temporary grants, and the top-up of the child support grant and other grants, um, and income support for those between the ages of 18 to 59 with no or little income needs to be um, priority. Um, yeah, so we, we haven't had any, any feedback okay. yet. All right. Mm. Now, Lynette, in many instances where social distancing or self-isolation self is not practiced, especially in the densely populated communities like uh, townships and informal settlements, so how should authorities get around this issue? Sorry, can you just repeat your question? In many instances, yeah, in many instances uh, wherein uh, social distancing is not practiced, especially those densely populated communities like the townships, like uh, informal settlements, uh, how do you think that authorities should get around this issue? Well, it, it's, it's challenging, you know. In, in some countries, um, what people have done to curb the coronavirus is that they um, they, they test people, um, and those who are found to have a virus, they actually put them in isolation um, in another space where they can be given the necessary uh, medical attention and so on. But uh, apart from food, we need to get energy sources into the houses, and we also need 
need to get cleaning materials and so on. But we, we, we are sitting with South, in South Africa with a problem that in informal settlements um, and in some of the households, the spaces are small. That's, that's mm. just how it is. We, we can't do much about changing that. And f some families might be large. So um, the issue of, of removing people who, who are um, sick or have TB or so on would, would probably be uh, a best way of, of dealing with that. Right. And just how prepared are we as a country in dealing with the mental health and the social consequences uh, that will no doubt come through as a result of COVID-19? Well, I mean, there's the stress already of people um, not getting uh, or, or, or um, not be affected by, infected by the, the COVID virus. So that's a big stress in everybody's head. But the stresses that come from not having food in your house, not having energy sources, not having cleaning materials, um, not having to be able to provide for your family um, is a huge issue. And I mean, if, if people don't have resources to keep their, their health intact, and then they have worries about um, what will happen tomorrow when I don't have food, when I can't feed my child, when I don't have any food to take my tablets, etc. Those are, are very, very worrying and concerning issues for people. And, and, and government needs to take, take note of that. And I, I think I'm fearful that there will be a certain volatility um, that comes with that. I mean, already the lack of resources, et cetera, produce conflicts in households. They produce conflict in, in the larger society. And the incidences of violence that we have seen um, is, 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 is an indication of, of just the pressure that people are feeling in their households and now they're expressing it externally. So the president and his team will have to act quite soon um, on all these issues. And Lynette, there are those who believe that the situation in South Africa could become uh, socially volatile in some parts of the country, especially if the, uh, the, the lockdown is extended further. Do you think this is an, a fair or accurate observation? No, I don't think it's an unfair situation. I think that that volatility will probably increase if, if nothing is done. So I'm going to repeat my call for the president and for cabinet and for those responsible to act sooner rather than later because it is at breaking point. Yeah. All right, Lynette Mott, uh, the National Director for Black Sash. Thank you so much for your time. Much appreciated.